right. So you are here tonight um, for kind of an overview presentation. This is a good one to kick us off in our parent series um, because this is looking at transition as a whole. So what is transition? You're probably hearing about it um, through your students and their IEPs. Um, so we're going to kind of go over the process as a whole and um, and what we are going to have is later in the year some other parent sessions that will really get into more detail on some of the topics that we'll discuss tonight. Um, definitely feel free to shoot any questions my way, but just know too, if you got the link for this meeting, that means that you definitely got the link for the others. Um, and they will do deeper dives into some other topics throughout the year. So let's go ahead and look at our agenda. Um, we will do some introductions. We'll kind of go over an overview of the transition planning process the roles of parents, students, staff, um, as well as adult agencies, which I forgot to list there, um, transition throughout the IEP, and then some other various transition topics that you may be wondering about um, that will come up and some timelines. So things to think about um, as we go. And then we'll have time at the end uh, to share some resources and to answer any questions that I don't get to. Um, I am here. I will be looking at the chat while we go, but please feel free if you do have a question um, and I didn't notice anything, feel free to turn on your microphone. We're a small enough group tonight um, and that's totally fine if you if you just want to say a question out loud. So my name is Carly McIntosh. I'm a transition facilitator. Um, if you don't know already, there are transition facilitators all throughout the county um, supporting a bunch of different schools. I am in the Northwest region supporting a few schools and programs, but there are also transition facilitators assigned to every secondary school, middle school, high school, um, and RPS files programs. So you can talk to your student's case manager or IEP chairperson to connect with your school's transition facilitator, or um, you know, feel free to let me know at the end of this if you don't know who that person is and I can connect you pretty quickly as well. Um, and while we're doing introductions, if you all are able to access the chat, um, I'd love to hear kind of what grade levels we have in the room. So if anybody in here is, you know, if we can tailor the conversation a little bit more um, to maybe answer some questions you may have, if you can answer in the chat maybe what grade your student is in um, or whether it's middle school or high school. Okay, ninth grade, high school ninth, eighth, okay, great. So I'm seeing eighth and ninth. So you all are here right at the right time. This is a great time to be collecting information. Um, you are early enough in the process that hopefully none of this is overwhelming and just a little bit to, to hear and get ready. Um, but if there are any folks joining us with older students too, everything applies and we'll get into that. Thanks for sharing. So if questions are coming up um, that might pertain a little bit more to you all, I'll try to, try to tailor some questions to our younger students. Um, but thank you, thanks for sharing. So sort of an overview um, of this transition planning, we really wanna start on the earlier side. So I know we've got some eighth grade, ninth grade parents in here. We're starting that year that students turn 14. Um, and that's when we are federally mandated through IDEA to start this process. Um, but it also starts even before that with career awareness, um, just a little bit informally. But we're formally starting at 14, um, really to start the exposure process um, to, to careers and self-reflection and self-advocacy, um, determining what students like and don't like, um, and starting to focus a little bit on that course of study and maybe what students are interested in and making sure that we're aligning course of study um, with some of those interests that they have. So you'll see this little infographic here. This is from our old transition planning guide from the state of Maryland, um, and it kind of talks about this cycle that we go in um, when we're transition planning, much like we would 
plan for academics or any other components of your students' educational needs. Um, we're trying to keep those expectations high and we're using specially designed instruction um, based on the planning and the assessments that we've done. And we'll get a little bit into that planning process next, but we really are kind of following this cycle every year of assessing students, what their interests are, um, you know, planning for what some of those activities could look like that are benefiting them as they're looking forward to their careers um, and even just education and the next steps needed for that. And then taking data, monitoring that progress and evaluating again. Um, it is a process and we use this word process because it changes. It changes year to year. Um, that's normal. It should be that way that students are learning more about themselves and really getting um, to hone in on what their interests are as they try new things and get better at self-reflecting and advocating for what they like. So transition planning as a whole is focusing on these components as some of our main areas, but um, really looking at that student and what life is going to be like for them after high school. Um, so for those of you who are middle school families, um, that first transition is from middle school to high school. And I know that's a big one and can feel like a really big one. The next transition then is the really big one, um, moving on into adult life and trying to take into consideration um, individualized needs for every student. So just as your IEP and your academics are individualized to a student, that transition planning piece should be as well. We need to look at what students are engaging with in their community, um, where they plan to live, um, what that living arrangement may look like for them when they leave um, employment goals, which do tend to change um, year to year. Transportation, how are students going to get around? Is this a student who wants to drive, may want to drive, maybe they're not sure if they want to drive, um, public transportation and different access to their community. And then of course that education and training piece um, and all the different pathways to get there. We have students that are interested in the military. We have students that want to go into training programs first. Um, so all the different pathways that may take a student to those end of the line post-secondary goals. So one thing that I definitely wanted to talk about, and I put it at the beginning of the presentation because I do think it helps us to kind of get centered around the why, why are we doing this so early um, and why so often, um, and really what the role of the transition facilitator um, and why there's such a big emphasis on this. When students are in school, um, they fall under IDEA, which is the um, this federal act that makes students entitled to a free appropriate and public education. And so this entitlement piece is what you're gonna have while you're in school. These are all of your services, um, related services, the instruction, the accommodations, and that is something that students are entitled to when they're in school. Once students leave the school system and they go into even college and academic institutions, we're looking more at eligibility. Um, and so this is the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. So this really is when we get into reasonable accommodations and things that individuals have to qualify for. Um, and so, you know, we say a lot, there's no IEPs in college, <laughs> there are no IEPs at work. There are, however, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act and students are able to access reasonable accommodations, but that's why it's so important for us to be working on these things now like self advocacy and really getting to know our students and what they want to do so that we can prepare them um, to advocate for those needs moving forward, because that responsibility really shifts from the school system as an institution to the individual um, and the people that are helping them along the way. So we're gonna jump next into roles. Um, so talking about how each and every person kind of fits into this mold and how we're supporting students. But I do wanna pause just to give um, people a chance to ask any questions if they have them yet. I know I'm kind of talking a little quickly. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm gonna give the crowd a minute. Okay. There is a little raise hand feature if you want, or like I said, I'll be monitoring the chat. 
OK, so let's jump into some of these different roles. Uh, first, we have the parents in the family. Um, and these roles are taken from the uh, Maryland State Department of Education's Transition Planning Guide, um, which is a really, really great resource that I'm going to talk about a little bit later and want to make sure that all of you have. Um, it has great information. It was just updated last year to what I think is a much uh, more visually appealing setup um, for you to kind of read through and get some ideas for ways that you can support students. But these are some of the bigger ones um, that kind of jumped out at me. Um, first and foremost, participating in your IEP and transition planning meetings. Uh, like I said, starting at age 14, that transition planning is one of the major um, components of the IEP and really should be driving a lot of the IEP um, and, uh, and where we're going with the academic goals. Sharing and learning about your students' strengths and interests. So you're doing that by participating in the IEP. Um, but as they're going throughout their academic careers, learning what they really like and what they're good at, what they need. You all are some of the greatest advocates as parents um, as you watch your student grow and learn um, and can really help them with that self-reflection piece as one of their most trusted adults. Helping them to access other partners and services. So we're going to get into this a little bit when we talk about outside of school services. Um, but there's a lot that students with documented disabilities can access out there. Um, and when we kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, the eligibility versus entitlement, a lot of these services do rely on families and students to advocate and get out there and make the commitment on their own. Um, and so your help in doing that is so key um, to make sure that they're getting connected and going where they need to go, attending those internships, um, getting out there for college and career fairs and, and things like that. Advocating for your students' goals. Being here tonight is a great way to get informed so that you can do that. Um, you know, getting some knowledge about the process so that when you're sitting in that IEP meeting, you can advocate for um, what their goals are and how we can help as a school system to get them there. And then supporting them in exploring their future um, and really allowing them to have new ideas and look into things. Oh, you're interested in marine biology. Let's look into that. What kind of jobs are in that field? Um, and allowing those conversations to flow. I know um, it's not always the easiest to get middle schoolers and high schoolers to talk to you for an extended period of time, but if you have some um, ability to do that, that's great. And that's what we're here to do too as transition facilitators and teachers and case managers um, to really try to pull that information out of them. The reviewing the transition timeline, we're going to get into that a little bit later, but just little steps along the way um, to kind of make this bite sized year by year. Um, and then students. So one of the big things that we're pushing for um, is for students to participate in their IUP and transition planning meetings. I know for all students, this doesn't always seem um, like the most fun way to spend their time. Some students are intimidated. Um, they might be um, a little bit either shy to attend the meetings or um, nervous or but it is important for them to know what their strengths and needs are. Um, and there's going to be a whole other um, information session on self-advocacy, but this is really where it starts. And this is something you can do as a parent too and encouraging your student to participate um, so that they know uh, what it is that they're working on. They can have some accountability in that and also express what their strengths are and express what their interests are, um, and which is the next couple. So understanding what their strengths and challenges are is going to help them to have better outcomes when they leave. Um, identifying some of those goals and outcomes. Part of what they're doing in preparation for their IEP is doing a variety of career interest inventories. Um, so we're not expecting them just to know off the top of their head what it is that they want to do when they grow up. Um, I think a lot of us in the room could probably argue that we're still, um, you know, growing and learning um, and we have more to learn about ourselves and, and more progress to make. Um, but they do have resources and these are the things we want to start getting them thinking about um, by participating in those transition activities um as well i think i hear a microphone on does someone have a question no okay feel free to stop me all right so next is the school system so this is bcps as a whole um, your school communities your iep teams but really the system as a whole um, it is on us 
to make sure that we are connecting you with community services. So that's one of the bigger roles, and you're going to hear more about that um, as we talk a little bit about the agencies outside of school. Um, so what a Oh, I got a question from uh, Pat Carter. Yes, this information will be available. Um, thank you so much for asking that. We're recording the session right now, so you'll be able to view it. Um, at the end, I also have a little Google form QR code where you can uh, request the, the slides, um, and I can send that to all of you um, as well, whoever, whoever would like it. Um, so facilitating that meaningful course of study, that's another thing that the school system is doing. We're making sure that all of our um, students are have access to the courses that they need um, and making sure that um, our programs are, are supporting them in their goals. So going on field trips, participating in work-based learning, um, and really getting the instruction that they need. And lastly, providing information to students and families about those agencies that they can benefit from after high school. So a lot of these agencies um, we'll talk about that students can access during school, but also when they leave so that we're handing them off to someone and they're not just stepping out um, without any of that guidance. So here uh, is that outside piece. These are the adult agencies. Question. We have one question. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Later, if a student originally had their neuro neuropsych eval in middle school, do they need to have another one in late high school before transitioning out? Oh, great question. Um, and you will be going, students go through the reevaluation process every three years, um, just as mandated by special education uh, law. We do, you know, when we're connecting with agencies, it is good that they have updated information. Um, so make sure you're paying attention. If they've just had a meeting, you know, so let's say in eighth grade, then they should be up again for another reevaluation, not in ninth or 10th, but 11th grade. Um, and that would be the year that they um, would be up for evaluation. Those are things that you can advocate for too, as part of their planning, um, you know, for the post-secondary uh, agencies? That's a great question to ask. Some of the agencies will, um, you know, do testing if they need it, um, but others will require it for eligibility. Um, and that's why it's really important that we make these connections now while students are in high school, while you still have access to the school psychologist, um, the school social worker, and and that those educational evaluations through the school system. So definitely take advantage of that every three years as it comes up to have that conversation with your IEP team. And um, in order to get these done on the outside, it can cost upwards mm -hmm. of three, four thousand dollars. So as yeah. I always tell parents, um, you know, we do it for free. Take it and keep it. <laughs> Yep. That way you don't have to lay out that funding later. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. And I and that was one thing that I probably didn't put in the, you know, what parents can do. I know it's in the MSDE um, transition planning guide, but hold on to those documents. Um, make sure you keep a copy of them. Um, I know the school has to hold on to them for so long of a period of time as well, but, you know, it it definitely benefits you to have a copy um, and, and keep track of those school records so that as you're um, moving out of the school system, you always know where to find those educational records. Hi, great, great question. Um, and so these adult agency partners, they're state, local agencies. Um, you may have heard of things like DOORS, good follow-up question, a neuropsych evaluation. So I'm not sure, Joyce, you may be able to answer this. Um, as far as I know, the psychological evaluations are done through the schools where they're looking at learning and cognitive processing. Um, and so that would be necessary for a student to be found eligible for an IEP and for special education. Neuropsych, um, I'm not sure if that's what they're doing in the school system. Joyce, you may be able to answer that. That yeah. to me sounds a little more private. Yeah, um, that that can be done like at Kennedy Krieger and those kind of agencies that that do it for other reasons like if the child maybe had head trauma and they want to see you know um what the effects are um that kind of information but what what we can provide is a psychological and um the educational assessment and then if the student also has ot pt or speech they usually have reports then i would recommend getting a copy of that before the student actually leaves um, you get it for free because 
um, every three years, our, our school system has to update the child's progress. So part of that includes the psychological, um, that kind of stuff. If you go to an outside agency like um, uh, Kennedy Krieger, then you have to pay for it. And they're the ones that can run up to three or four thousand um, dollars in order to have the testing done and then get the get the report. Thank you. I hope that answered that um, for for everybody wondering about the testing in order to get an IEP and, and to have special education services. Your students would have had to go through that testing um, and or would have had the opportunity to go through that testing as part of that eligibility process. Um, so certainly something to check in with your IEP chairs about if you don't know when the last time it was um, your IEP chair, your case manager um, for adults. That's a good question. And that is harder, um, you know, once they've left the school system, um, you know, we can no longer provide the neuropsychological evaluations for them, but there are services like Joy said with Kennedy Krieger um, or other places. Um, if it's a student who's connected with DOORS, um, the Department of Rehabilitative Services, they can sometimes refer you um, to different places to look for a neuropsychological, but that would need to be done, you know, as adults, once they've left the school system, um, that does need to be done you know, out of your own pocket and and with a community neuropsych. So the agency, adult agency partners are these, I mentioned DOORS, the Department of Rehabilitative Services, um, things like um, different, different agencies out there that are supporting our students once they, uh, when they're in school and once they leave school. So these, um, are different agencies that are supporting transition planning. Um, they're providing opportunities for courses and programs. Um, some of them will help in providing work-based learning experiences, um, providing work exploration experiences, um, and benefits counseling. So things that you know each student may need are individual to them. Um, and again, this is you know eligibility based, but we talk about doors a lot um, because that is the one that can provide pre-employment services while students are still in school and anyone with an IEP qualifies for those. Um, whether it's the right fit for them um, is determined by each student, um, but some of these adult agencies we'll get into a little bit later. Thank you. All right, so we're going to jump in next to sort of transition in the IEP and where you're going to see it throughout these IEP meetings. Um, so when your students turn 14, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, that formal transition planning is going to begin. So at this point, um, students are to be engaging in career assessments each year, um, along with student interest in her inventories um, just to look at what those interests are and start documenting and planning. So for students with an IEP, the public school system provides the educational supports um, that we want to align with those post-secondary outcomes. So we're going to talk a little bit about where you're going to see that throughout the IEP um, and make sure that this is one of the ways that you as a parent can advocate as well. Um, as you're going through the IEP to ask about these things, you know, what did my student score on their career interest inventory and um, and how that all connects with their annual goals. So transition and career assessments are updated yearly. It is just one data point that we use when considering um, career interest and compatibility. We know some students Thank you for that question. Um, because a 504 is only accommodations for academics, the transition planning piece um, doesn't formally exist for 504s. Students are still eligible to receive the career and college guidance that all students get from their counselors. Um, but this layer of an IEP for individualized programming um, is what encompasses transition. Joyce, I don't know if you have anything to, to offer there, um, but it's it's embedded in the IEP and not the 504. Correct. Um, the 504, it, if a student is in high school um, in Baltimore County, all high schools have a new um, position called a career navigator. 
and their job is to help students prepare to be college and career ready, um, hopefully by the 10th grade. So they are administering these transition interest inventories to all students um, within the school. So that might be something else you can kind of figure out who is who is this transition, I mean, who is this career navigator in my schools, um, in my high school, and then meet with them to get some information about, you know, what the child's interests were at that point in time. And also school counseling, um, we have a platform called Zello, it's X-E-L-L-O, and they also have some career interest inventories that can be done um, that through the counselor. So that would be another point of contact um, for any child that does have a 504 plan. Great, thank you. And so, like I was saying, we are collecting this as um, one point of data. Um, we know it's not everything and, and not everything is always shown um, in one instance or one assessment at a time, but it is good information to start getting students thinking about what their strengths and what their interests are um, and how interests, um, you know, don't always translate to a job, um, but what might their, what fields might their interests push them into. Um, I can't tell you how many students say they want to design video games or play video games. Um, and these assessments can kind of help us to say, okay, so you're interested, what part of that are you interested in? Are you interested in coding, for example? Um, or are you more interested in the digital art aspect and, and getting students into um, thinking about their interest through the lens of career and post-secondary goals? Um, the next section where, where we'll see transition is in that present level of academic achievement and functional performance, otherwise known as the PLAF pages. Did someone have a question? Okay. Um, they were unmuted. So I okay, just. Okay. All right. I can't tell what I'm presenting. Thank you. Um, transition planning. Um, when we're looking at this through the PLAF pages, um, students are, you know, required to have two sections now that they're 14 and older, um, including employment and education or training. Um, so this is where the results of those career assessments should be and where we're really looking at, you know, what students' goals are um, and what they may need to get there. If appropriate, we're also looking at independent living skills. So some of our students who really need a lot more help with the self-care skills um, or potentially navigating different traveling um, options if they may not be students who will drive, um, but looking into some of those different uh, self-care type skills. But for all students, we're looking at employment and education. The next piece is going to be the post-secondary goals or outcomes. So these, you'll kind of see them worded as upon graduation from high school, the student will blank. So given, you know, what your students' goals were um, and where they see themselves, you know, five, ten years after high school, um, where they're going to be. Um, so looking at um, different careers or for instance, um, where they're gonna be in education, or if they are going, if they see themselves in the military, or if they see themselves attending a work training program, you're gonna see that verbiage there um, throughout the IEPs. The other place is the transition activities. So these are activities that are going to occur within the year of a student's transition plan. Um, so these are the goals that we're writing um, and recording progress on quarterly that students can complete within that year and should be related to their post-secondary goals and ideally also their annual goals. So for example, um, if you have a student that uh, is interested in a specific uh, work site, let's say marine biology. So a student will locate two places in their community that employ people interested in marine biology and share with their case manager. So this is something that is concrete and objective that this student can do um, in their in the course of a year um, to share back with their case manager and kind of keep that reflection going. Um, another example might be that they're using online resources um, to determine a yearly salary and then using that to calculate their weekly and daily salary. So these are just examples. You're going to see these uh, in your students' IEPs um, and you'll be able to kind of to, to tell whether you think that that might be um, a good thing for them to focus on just during that one year. So this is sort of a short-term goal. 
based on those post-secondary long-term outcomes. The next page in the IEP that you're going to see, uh, these are those agencies that we were talking about before. So these are the four main um, sections within Maryland um, that we're looking at for our students. Um, DOORS, the Division of Re Rehabilitative Services, is the one that, like we said, all students will qualify for those pre-ET services. Um, and if you are, you know, getting consent forms uh, sent home to you um, and you're wondering about that, it's typically DOORS that we're recommending for most students. Um, some of our other agencies do have requirements for eligibility and maybe agencies that we're discussing more through the IEP team. Um, but these are, like I said, agencies outside of the school system that we're connecting students to, to make sure that they are, um, sorry, I'm just checking the chat, make sure that they are um, connected as they're in school and for when they get out of school. So now we're going to go into some other transition topics, the first being financial. So these are just things to think about. Um, again, every student is individualized, so their transition planning is going to be um, specific to them and their needs. One of the first thing would be Medicaid and Medicaid waivers. So the Department of Health admin, um, administers these and they are there are long wait lists um, and a lot of paperwork that needs to go uh, in to be on Medicaid wait lists and Medicaid waivers um, along with the DDA. So these are um, one form of financial support for students that really need that at home and community based supports. SSI is one that we see with a lot more of our students who may be eligible for SSI benefits. Um, and um, these are things to look at and consider. Uh, every student and their case is different, um, but just some different supports that students can use to either support them with rent or um, living expenses, or in the case for students who have significant needs, uh, there is funding available for students who are eligible um, that really funds their programming after high school. College and accommodations. I think we uh, talked about this a little bit, but there are no. Um, oh, thanks. Can you put your email address in the chat or may, maybe not? Maybe email me. <laughs> did you get your um, did you get my email address written down? I'm going to put it here real quick. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. I had a question. Um, email me with your uh, information and I will send you the PowerPoint as well as the recording once it's done, OK? So college and accommodations, as we talked about, there are no IEPs in college, but there are disability services offices. So we are in this, once we get into college, we're talking about students um, advocating for those needs. So students can choose to disclose whether they have a disability or not. Um, they don't have to. Um, and some students may get to the point by the time they're in college where they don't think they need the, the accommodations. Um, but what's important to know is that parents don't always have access to the student records once those students turn 18 and they're in a college institution. Um, and so once they're once they're there and once they're enrolled, it really is on the student to go into that disability services office and bring their documentation. So typically that is their most recent IEP, a psychological evaluation, an educational evaluation. Each school may have different requirements, um, but that is something that students can choose to do if they'd like to disclose um, in order to receive reasonable accommodations, maybe not all of them, um, but reasonable accommodations for their coursework. Another topic that I thought was worth mentioning is transportation. Um, we have the Maryland Transit Administration um, looking at different public transportation options. Um, there are, we talked about doors again, and it's coming up again. They do, um, you know, they do some driving assessments for students who are eligible for those services. So looking at whether a student has the, um, whether it be the cognitive or the motor abilities to uh, be drivers um, and how successful they are, um, and then also can provide or refer you to travel instruction or training programs. Um, so those are things to think about. How will students get around um, once they leave high school? Another one, and I have a QR code here because I know this has changed a little bit in the law recently, um, but supported decision making. So 
once students turn 18 and they are adults in the eyes of the law, um, they have the right to make decisions for themselves. Um, and there are different levels of supported decision making um, that, you know, this is very student specific, family specific, um, and individualized to those you know, different needs. And that's why there are so many different levels of support. So anything from guardianship, power of attorney, none. Um, but one thing just to keep in mind, um, if you have a student who you may be uh, wondering about these things, there's a little fact sheet here with this QR code. Um, and it's also available through that transition planning guide that I'm going to share with you all at the end as well. Um, another thing just sort of to mention here too, while students do um, you know, become adults in the eyes of the law in the state of Maryland, their educational rights do still remain with their parents while they're enrolled in school. Um, so that is something that I know we talk about every year in the IEP. Um, but while they're in school, those educational rights do still remain with the parents. But other things like, um, you know, getting a credit card or, um, you know, opening up bank accounts, buying a car. Um, I've seen it <laughs> with some students that, you know, really shouldn't be having the ability to make some of those decisions for um, themselves or maybe taken advantage of if they're in a vulnerable uh, population. And so it's important to think about and consider um, for some of our students that might need guidance in making decisions later in life. Again, it doesn't have to be anything legal, but check out this fact sheet um, and learn a little bit more about that. So the next section um, is the timelines. And I shared with you all that they're in this transition planning guide that, that you'll get at the end. They have shared timelines. I'm not gonna read every bullet point to you here, but they've broken it up into sort of bite-sized um, you know, age categories and just things to be thinking about. So they've broken it into ages 14 to 15, um, which is really a lot of, you know, providing opportunities and conversations. Um, there it is, keeping records of those services and activities and their educational records. Um, and looking into those applications for adult services. So for students with more um, intensive needs, the earlier the application, the better, um, because we want to make sure that they get on any wait lists if there are wait lists. For students who we know will be eligible for doors, um, we don't necessarily have to get on it right now, but students are eligible for services starting at 14. And so it's important to know what you have access to um, so that you can determine what's, what's the best route for you and your student. So this kind of goes back to the earlier, the better. For 16 and 17, um, I see transportation as a big one there once we're starting to talk about um, driving and encouraging some of those independent living skills like money management, health, and living, um, and really looking at uh, different age of majority conversations. So starting to think about, you know, when you turn 18 or after graduation, um, what what is this going to look like and how can we plan for that? For our 17 to 18, um, this is where we're really getting a, a concentration of those transition services. You are likely going to have a transition facilitator in meetings with you, um, really pushing to, to make sure students are connected um, when they leave school with some kind of agency um, and have access to the services that they are eligible for. Um, so you'll see a much bigger presence from us as transition facilitators in these last couple years of high school. Um, for those leaving between 17 and 18. And then 18 to 21. So for our students who stay with us um, until the age of 21, either going for a certificate or staying some extra time in order to get that diploma, um, we really are looking at those resources and connections still. Um, so encouraging um, as much participation as we can with agencies. Um, and determining, you know, eligibility and next steps to make sure students are really placed where they need to be when leaving school. All right, so we've kind of gotten to the end of our information here. I know we've had some really great questions throughout, um, and I breezed through uh, those timelines just because I'm going to give you that resource um, to, to view. But some of the big takeaways, making sure that you're reading through that transition planning guide, 
um, and connecting with your school-based transition facilitator. So like I said, if you haven't heard from that person this year, I know it's still you know a little early in the year, we're rounding out the end of this first marking period, um, but if you haven't heard from them, let me know um, and I can connect you um, or like I said, ask your case manager or your IEP chair. So this is my, my last little slide here. This QR code will take you to a Google form and let me put that in the chat as well. Um, the link to that, if it's easier to do it from your device that you're on now. Um, this is a Google form where you can request uh, the information from tonight. This is kind of the only way for me to take attendance and, and see who might need different things. But if you click that link, you should be able to fill out the form um, that just gives me your contact information and I can send you a copy of the transition planning guide as well as the slides from tonight. Uh, this transition planning guide here, you see the picture with the uh, young adults here on the cover, is the updated transition planning guide. Um, and this one was just done last year. I think that it's much more visually appealing. Um, things are broken up a little bit nicer uh, to read as opposed to the earlier one. Um, and so that's really good for you to have access to. But their website, the MSDU website, does not have the updated one up there um, right now. The link is broken. Every time I go to try to open it, I, I can't send it. Otherwise, I would have included a link. Um, but you can request it. I will follow up with you You know, as soon as I um, get your email from that form. Um, and then we'll also try to make sure we get a copy of it posted um, You know, on our website. As our, I know transition facilitators can share it with you as well. We all have it. So feel free to um, fill out the form and I'll hang out for a little while if anyone has any additional questions. If you received a list of all of the parent presentations that we are planning between now and the end of the year, um, there is a link at the bottom that tells you where all of these will be housed. Um, so I did put that in the in the chat as well, um, just in case you want to go back and you know take your time going through it. Perfect. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.